Hello, Psych of Emotion. How are you guys today? Let's talk a little bit about emotion and research. Uh, and for those of you, the, like the three out of you, 150, that will do the emotion and research paper, uh, obviously your choice, uh, this, this might be helpful. And notice that we do have this up on, we had this up, but this is a replacement for the one that was up on uh, Carmen. Those were shot last semester. They weren't very good. So I decided to go ahead and redo it. So let's talk emotion and research. Where are we? Yes, we're at the Masada in Israel. So bucks are showing their Buckeye pride just about everywhere they go. What are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, we're going to talk about research examples, and that's going to lead to a discussion of research methods and paradigms. So when we're researching emotion, a lot of different techniques are employed, and I hope to give you a kind of a, a cross-section of those techniques. Uh, I will warn you, this is one of the lengthier lectures. Uh, maybe that comes as no surprise, or maybe you're ready to tune out right now in hearing that. But uh, for those of you taking this paper option, cool. And also, there will be, <laughs> I hate to say this to you, but there will be content here that will be reflected in, uh, I believe it's quiz four, right? So I want to talk about some of my own research. Uh, you know, we, we've published a little bit of research, so there's probably, you know, a uh, hundred people out there in the world who've actually read what we've done. So now I get to torture you guys with it. Uh, but I, I want to begin by talking about anger as it relates to punitiveness. And my advisor at uh, Ohio State in the social psychology program was Phil Tetlock for my first three years. And then I was fortunate to get Marilyn Brewer as my advisor for my next three years. Phil had left to go to Berkeley. In my third year, he said, "I'm going to go to Berkeley, and I'm going to head the, I'm going to chair the Haas School of Business." He asked me if I wanted to go with him, but uh, it represented a lot of changes, and my wife had become embedded with her employment, and so it just wasn't in the cards for us to move back to Cali. Although it would have been cool, uh, and uh, Berkeley is obviously an awesome spot, but it just wasn't going to work out. So that's the nice thing about a big program. Phil left, and what did I do? I walked down the hallway, and I went to Marilyn. I said, Marilyn, are you willing to take me on? She said, let's do it. Uh, let's get busy. So advantage, if you're thinking of going to graduate school, one of the advantages to going to a larger program is that there are people who, uh, you know, you, you could take that spot. So that being said, uh, let's talk about this research a little bit. And this is my collaborators on this were Derek Rucker. And I, I loved working with Derek, no two ways about it. Uh, he's now at Northwestern. He's at the Kellogg Business School up there. Amanda Lynn Scott uh, came in the year after me into the Tetlock Lab. And uh, Amanda and I continue to be very good friends. And I'm also very good friends with her husband, Jacob. And then, of course, we were working with Phil. Uh, on this, and this is part of Phil's research program that he'd been working on for maybe 20 years. Uh, we were just participating in a small portion of that. So what did we find? Well, we found that anger mediates the relationship between transgression violation and the level of punishment. So in all the ways we tried to predict how Ohio State students, participants, would punish uh, someone who'd committed crimes uh, within our scenarios, what we found is the single best predictor, the most reliable predictor, was the level of anger that the participant felt from the crime translated most directly to their punishment preferences. And, and the findings that, you know, this was a very straightforward paradigm. There, there's no mystery here. This wasn't tremendously creative in the research design. Participants would read crime stories, and this is over a year's time, and many different stories, many different participants. Participants then assign blame to the perpetrator in the stories, and participants self-report emotions are assessed. So we would ask people, how angry did this crime make you? How afraid did this crime make you? How disgusted did this crime make you? You know, that we would focus on, on you know, half a dozen to a dozen emotions, uh, whatever we thought might be predictive. And, and we found that anger, right, was the best predictor. So later, as we continued to work uh, in this area and, and attempt to do different studies, Rucker and I also, we, we hypothesized that anger and fear will be linked to punishment preferences. So not only did anger then, and we demonstrated that anger would cause people to punish more, ask for more jail time, for example, 
We believe that to the extent that people are frightened by the crime, they might choose a, or have a different punishment preference. So, anger should lead to punitive, retributive style punishments. Uh, maybe busting rocks, you know, 20 years at hard labor, or picking up trash along the highway, right? The, the, the kind of these physically punishing punishments. Fear, we figured, might lead to incapacitation type punishments, a desire to lock someone up where no one could find them, or uh, put them in solitary confinement. And let's use Charles Manson as the example. Charles Manson was a scary guy, and, and a lot of people were intimidated and extremely frightened. We do not want Charles Manson out on the highway under supervision picking up trash. We want to lock him up and throw away the key where he can't come in contact with anyone, corrupt anyone, influence anyone, because we're scared of his potential. So Derek and I set off on this mission to kind of look and differentiate fear and anger and, and show that it led to different punishment preferences. More on that in a little bit. So what did Phil then determine in his huge model for punishment? Uh, and, and of course his research spanned 20 years and really literally involved two dozen different research, uh, researchers or research assistants. So what he was trying to establish is that people can enter into what he wanted to call a prosecutorial mindset. And when people get into this mindset, they want to punish and they want to punish more severely. So we're walking around day to day and all of a sudden we encounter something that's super heinous and we go, oh my God, that person has to pay, right? The situation has caused the the creation of the prosecutorial mindset at that moment in time. So what is the prosecutorial mindset? Well, it was moral outrage, so someone may do something that is just horrible, right? And it's also influences and is affected by our punishment goals, and typically punishment is harsher, and often along the lines of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, uh, right? And, and, and the character attributions are the way we describe the perpetrator of the crime. Uh, and, and their level of responsibility, etc. So what influences this? Well, the situational triggers. So with, that's what we did in the lab, is we manipulated the situational triggers. That is, we present people with a crime, and that triggers then, we're hypothesizing the prosecutorial mindset. Now, you see over here, and it says dispositional triggers. What does that mean? It means that some people have a stronger desire to punish others Right, so that, that that's an individual difference variable, and that's why we call it dispositional triggers. So, in our research paradigm, we could manipulate the situational triggers by the story we wrote, but the dispositional triggers are what people bring to the laboratory. So, while we could manipulate this, we sometimes measured that, and one of the measures we typically used was right-wing authoritarianism. Now, the potential link severing variables influence the ability of motivation to self-correct. So the initial punitiveness is the result of the prosecutorial mindset, but reflective judgments, that is when we think back and we consider, or let's suppose we listen to a victim impact statement. And, and the defense presents that this person, you know, was raised in an abusive home, they dropped out of school early, they had no advantages, then we might want to cut back on the punishment. So that's where the reflective thought comes in. The idea is that essentially we tend to be fair, but we do carry a bias, right? But it is correctable, and that's where Phil came up with the FBC model. And this was kind of my first introduction to the idea, and Marilyn, my second advisor, talked about this. Don't think about conducting a study. Think about conducting a research program that extends over time, uses many different experiments to kind of establish a construct. So. Uh, many of us participated with Phil. Now, let's talk about anger and fear as having uh, opposite effects on risk assessment and behavior. So, how, how do the, the presence of anger or fear cause us, in this case what they used is a gambling paradigm, participants primed to be angry, they found took greater risks, losing more money. They calculate probability of winning as higher than people in the fear condition. 
So this is interesting that people, you know, when they're afraid, then they tend to, you know, kind of elevate their judgments of potential risk. They say, wow, this is pretty risky. And notice that that should be consistent with a, uh, with a fear uh, a visceral response, right? Whereas with anger, what we're talking about is people then begin to judge less effectively. And this is one of the downsides of anger. It leads to riskier behavior. Participants in the fear condition are more risk averse and therefore quit well before those in the anger condition. And we can see how fear and anger might be adaptive in this case. Anger when necessary might push us to take risks, right? A and if we win, then there's a payoff. But if we lose, right, not so much. Fear sends us backwards so that we're more likely to survive the situation. So this came to us from Dasher Keltner at Berkeley and Jennifer Lerner, who's been bouncing around uh, Carnegie Mellon, I believe, and I think she's left Carnegie Mellon. I'm not sure where she is now. But let's go ahead and listen to Jennifer here for a minute, her own words on the importance of emotion. In my past work, we've looked a lot at how people's emotional responses are useful predictors across time uh, in terms of predicting responses to terrorism and uh, policy preferences regarding terrorism. And that's part of a broader body of work in which we find very often that emotional react reactions actually happen to have more predictive power than people's attitudes in terms of driving ultimate behavior that there is something very uh, powerful about a feeling um, that directly links to behavior. And it has to do, in large part, with the underlying neural circuitry and um, how close emotion neural circuitry is to motor activity and actual behavior. And there we have it from the Harvard Kennedy School. Jen Lerner. And uh, what do Jen Lerner and I share in common? We're both Tetlock students. And, and Tetlock has turned out some pretty powerful students in the form of Lerner, among others. Linda Stitka, uh, Penny Visser, some really high-level players. Uh, I'm kind of the oddball because I just went on. I gave up research to just solely focus on teaching. But let's think about what Jen said, that emotional response might be more predictive of future behavior than attitudes are. And, and I kind of like this because at Ohio State, you know, we are the bastions of attitude research, the leaders in attitude research, attitudes, attitudes, attitudes. But what this is saying is emotions might actually be more predictive than attitudes are. And, and I think that's kind of cool. And, and it's kind of an easy story for people to wrap their heads around. That that, that visceral response, right, and, and maybe attitudes function as powerfully as they do because the attitudes are linked to the visceral response. And, and then she goes to talk about, you know, briefly uh, implicate the neuroscience behind it. And that, that's why neuroscience is a cool place to be right now. So let's take emotion in the lab. And, and now I want to look at manipulations. I want to look at measures and provide examples throughout uh, again, if you're writing the paper on research of emotions or if you just have an interest in a future research career, I sure would urge you maybe to find a way to study emotion, at least in part, depending on what you're interested in. So ancient labs, kind of cool looking, right? But let's talk about the independent variable first. So methods 101. No, this is methods 4000 level to a certain extent. The independent variable, if we bring people into the lab and we want to put them into an emotional state so we can randomly assign people to different conditions, different emotion conditions, and then study the effect of those different emotions on sub sub some subsequent process or task or judgment, right? We can use linguistic priming, uh, and that is we can prime through narratives, through stories. Uh, we can use visual images as priming manipulations, right? We can use recollection paradigms. We can ask people to recall a time when they were very angry or recall a time when they were very sad as a priming manipulation that might affect their behavior 
behavior on the subsequent task. We might employ behavioral methods and, and maybe performance-based, like video games. All right, and, and I think video games are a, a really underexploited uh, source here. We can also talk about having them engage in physical activity. If we want to create just simple arousal, and I've done this in a couple of my experiments, we just want to jack the arousal up, kick that affective stream into a higher gear, right? We can have participants perform some kind of physical manipulation that causes their heart rate and subsequently the, the rest of their physiology to increase, right? Amy Cudi has done things with uh, to engender confidence by uh, asking people to power pose, right? And some people are assigned a condition where they power pose and then engage in some kind of task. The other people are randomly si assigned to a condition where they slump and they get small, which is the inverse of power posing, right? And then who remembers chemical manipulations? Schachter and Sk Singer, for example, in their misattribution paradigm, uh, use chemicals. I want to talk right now about some story priming a fear, and Derek and I were using stories, and, and the way this would work is we would bring participants in the laboratory, and, and we almost always did the same thing with priming manipulations. That is, we have to prime a participant into a certain state, but we have to keep them unaware that they've entered that state, or that their state will not affect their performance on a subsequent task. So we need some kind of dividing line. And the way we would do this is we would bring people in the laboratory and say, hey, you're here for the experiment? And they'd say, yes, I am. And we'd say, you signed up for a half hour? And they said, yes, I did. And I said, OK, uh, here's the deal. We got a bunch of small experiments. We got a bunch of like three to five minute experiments, but we're going to have you do four of them, and that's going to equal up to the half hour. You, you okay with that? And people say, sure, you know, they just want to get the hell out of there. They're not paying attention anyway, uh, and which is good for us, right? So then we would present experiments in order that the participant was told or disconnected, didn't have anything to do with each other, right? But in fact, they did. So the priming manipulation is generally the first experiment. experiment. And in this case, we would have people, we'd say, we've got a, a small reading comprehension task. So we give them a story to read, and then they, we would ask them a couple comprehension questions afterwards. When they were done that with that, that they would set that aside. And then they would pick up another story, and that was the crime story in which we wanted to see how emotion affected their perception of the criminal behavior and their ultimate goals and punishment. So the priming manipulation, right, is billed as a task, but it isn't. It's just to set the stage for their reading the crime story. So for example, here's how we prime fear using the story method. And this is a story that we used. Uh, and, and this goes back. I, I'm talking 2002 here. And Ebola virus had been discovered in Africa, and everyone was wigging out because they didn't understand it, and it was so freaking dangerous. So here's a story we wrote. Ebola virus attacks student exchange students on U.S. soil. And this was an African-based right, disease. It, it hadn't hit the U.S. yet. People were afraid that it might. Just over a month ago, six American exchange students returning from Zaire, Africa, were diagnosed with a deadly Ebola virus. As they arrived at the Los Angeles International Airport, one of the six students collapsed on the way to the baggage claim area. While the other students first assumed the collapsed student was simply exhausted from the flight, they were horrified to see blood coming from the nose and mouth of their fallen schoolmate. The young woman was rush rushed to the hospital where she died two days later. This is the first fatality from Ebola recorded in the United States. Her classmates were rounded up and quarantined in the hospital. Subsequently, three of the remaining five students died from loss of blood through all body orifices, as is the result of the virus. Internal organs, circulatory system literally dissolve. It's not understood how one-third of those infected survive the disease. No cure exists. And then it goes on. I, I've got it cut up here a little bit because the story is longer than this. The genie's out of the bottle uh, in the United States now, warns someone from the CDC. Because so little is known about the disease's spread, coupled with its ability to lie dormant for a period of time before new cases surface to kill its victims, virtually no one is safe from the infection. So people randomly assigned to this condition, we assume that they're afraid, and, and we have measures to show that they were scared by the story, they, they found it frightening, right? And we expect that fear then to carry over in their perceptions of the criminal act in the next portion of the experiment, right? Well, we didn't have the 
greatest level of success and we tried a bunch of different versions a bunch of different techniques and we just weren't able to differentiate fear from anger in our laboratory experiment a little more on that later now that's a priming manipulation that represents one type of independent variable I've got more to show you but let's talk about the dependent variable measuring emotion and how measuring emotion is done and this is across a wide range of laboratories uh, a long period of time and many different researchers so we can we can use a self-report we can we can just simply use questionnaires how are you feeling right now right uh, we, can all, we can also look at case studies and, and uh, the effect of emotion in a, in a case study. We can use indirect measures, physiological like body language. People who are frightened tend to get small and closed up. Right? People who are angry tend to get large and spread out. Right? We can look at proximity and people who are afraid tend to dis, uh, distance themselves from a stimulus. Uh, angry people might actually approach a stimulus. We can look at skin conductance, that is measure the amount of perspiration, which is an indicator of sympathetic nervous system activation. Heart rate, another indicator of sympathetic uh, nervous system activation. We can draw blood, we never did because it gets really complicated, but we can test for levels of cortisol. All right? We can also look indirect measures. We can set up a situation where they need to help, and we find happy people are more likely to help. So the time to render help might be uh, an indicator of their emotional state. We can use indirect measures like facial coding. We've talked about, and notice that Ekman teaches people how to do that. We can use projective tests like the Rorschach. Um, linguistic coding. We can have people write things, and then we can code for emotional content. We've talked about... Uh, issues like that or we'll talk about issues like that we can look at implicit associations and this is probably underdone and I think there's some fruitful uh, results to be had there working off kind of like an implicit association test type paradigm uh, other behavioral measures like social distance, the distance between people, risk taking as, as we've seen. We can measure the level of anger and aggression by allowing participants to dial in shocks for another participant and look how f uh, large a shock they're willing to cause someone. That would be shock intensity or the, the length of time of the shock. One set of experiments, pretty interesting, if you, the other participant angers you, you're allowed to make them eat hot sauce. How many teaspoons of hot sauce do you make them eat? The idea being the angrier you are, the more hot sauce you make them eat, right? And obviously that can be measured. So these are all dependent measures that have been used in one form or another within the research of emotion. And this is not even a complete list. But let's take a, a look. If we want to see what tends to scare a person, and then if we do this for multiple people, we can kind of get an idea of what stimuli in our environment people find most scary. So the fear schedule listed below are 51 objects and situations using the scoring system below, which is up to the upper right there actually, rate each on the intensity of fear associated with the specific event. So to what extent are you afraid of sharp objects, right? Failing a test, suffocating, worms, being alone, being a leader, uh, life after death, needles, and so it goes, right? And you can see some utility in this. Strange dogs, right? Or, or meeting authority. Snakes. Uh, to what extent? Uh, stinging insects. So this gives us an idea. It's one way to measure uh, people's, or, or to rank order, essentially, these fear-evoking stimuli. Let's call it good for part one.